people all across this great nation are in pain. Your most effective talking point are these magic words. Less than 1% of people get addicted to Oxycontin. That's not possible. We're going to do everything in our power to make sure justice is served. That's a clip from the Hulu series Dope Sick, a show about the whole Oxycontin and opioid crisis, which of course is so tragic, so hard to hear. But I think we have to go there because first and foremost, Dope Sick is really about the corruption of science. And that's really a great tie in to today's guest, the very excellent Ricky Verandez, creator and host of the Ripple Effect podcast, where he has interviewed some of the most top-notch scientists, I mean, people who just have stellar academic and publishing credentials, but are being banned, of course, and suppressed because they don't follow the pandemic dogma. And you just can't get a better example, I think, hard example of the corruption of science than that. So we do talk about that. But if you've listened to Skeptico, you might anticipate that I pulled Ricky in some other directions as well. For example, we do not want to get pulled into another one of those protracted medical discussions. What we want to understand is, is the driving force behind this something that we could identify as good old fashioned evil? So I do realize that this is a drum I've been pounding on for a while, but it always generates such an interesting discussion. Because you don't want to go there, Ricky. That's where I'm pushing you. That's how I want to get skeptical. It's well, not about, right. it's not just about pleasant conversations. It's not just about everyone has an opinion and I'm going to start a commune in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Oh, even better. I got my seeds stacked up in the garage and, you know, I can last. Obviously, none of that works because on, on some kind of grander spiritual level, who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? No, absolutely. It's evil. And I think that a lot of the people who are the most outspoken, the mo people that I've taught, Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Carrie Madej, Del Bigtree, Mickey Willis, all these people are spiritual or religious. And they're the ones who seem, and and, and I could go down the list. You, you attempted to scare the shit out of the population for 18 months, it worked on in, in many cases. There's a lot of people out there who truly, truly are afraid. So I think there's true believers. There's some people who truly are pushing or helping the evil people who have a greater agenda, who aren't true believers in the nonsense that they're pushing on the public, but using these people as pawns. Ricky is really doing some great work with the Ripple Effect podcast and with the Union of the Adwanted show terrific show he co-created along with Charlie and Mike and Sam Tripoli. So it was great having him on and having this kind of dialogue, even though I had to do the little bit of the skeptical thing because, well, that's really where I'm coming from. I mean, we don't want an echo chamber. We don't want to replace an echo chamber with another echo chamber. We just want to get to the truth. And sometimes the truth is messy. Here's my interview with Ricky Verandez. If you like it, share it around. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Kares, and today we welcome Ricky Verandez to Skeptico. Ricky is the creator and host of the very popular and very excellent, great, great interview-based show, The Ripple Effect, and the co-creator of the podcast that probably has the best chance of saving the world and all of humanity, the Union of the Unwanted. I was on Ricky's show a few weeks ago. It was really great. Um, a little bit uncomfortable at times, but I'm always uncomfortable with the uncomfortable. And Ricky was right there with me. I think we really kind of had a deep dive into some stuff. We might pick up on some of those threads 
But what I really wanted to do is introduce you to this guy and his awesome work, if you're not aware of it. So Ricky, welcome to Skeptico. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Alex. I, I really appreciate it. Well, like I said, I think we're going to have, uh, you know, I think we're gonna have a good time, uh, maybe, right. But the first thing we ought to do is I gave this kind of introduction, but actually we first turned on the screen, man, you have your guitars in the background. If people, you know, are list, most people are listening to the show or not watching it, but yeah, it's a very cool studio and that's where Ricky started. And then I'm also showing the, the shows on there, the ripple effect, the union unwanted and Ricky rants on rock fan. So tell us how this all got started for you, Ricky, and a little bit about these shows. I will, but before I forget it, I've been meaning to ask you, when are you coming to Rockfin? You are, are you ever gonna maybe post there or have you contemplated going over to Rockfin? Because it's a great platform for people like you and I who are willing to kind of go wherever the conversation takes you and, and talk about maybe fringe topics or things that are, are slightly controversial because it's uncensored. You don't have to worry about it. And I, have you had any issues with, with YouTube in the past? Um, not, not the kind that most people have flying under the radar, <laughs> which is both, which is both good and bad. You know, it's like you got, but you know, I was talking to Charlie about it and I, 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 I'd welcome that. I'd also, We'll we'll have a separate conversation about that because I think what you guys are doing has really does have have a lot of uh, a lot of potential and you know I was on the union with you last night you were so nice to invite me on and it was awesome it was depressing because it was truth oriented and even though people wanted to point to solutions it's a pretty grim situation that we're in. But better to face it, like you guys did on the Union of the Unwanted, than to pretend it's something different. So big congrats to you all for putting that together and doing that. And uh, yeah, I'm 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 open to I'm open to whatever works in the in the larger sense. And I know that's what you're doing too. You're just trying to figure out, you know, what makes sense to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of those people that and. You know, you come from a business background and I also have kind of been in the corporate world a little bit slightly uh, a lot of my life. Uh, right after high school, uh, we started a family, a family owned construction company. My father had a previous construction, actually had two previous construction companies with partners and both of them didn't work out. And he's just like, screw it. It doesn't matter how, how well you think, you know, somebody once money gets involved, as, as most of us know, things change. So he's like, I'm not going to start another company unless the kids want to help because he's a, uh, I was born in Portugal, came to America when I was four, but my dad grew up most of his life there. And then when he came to America, he came to Ludlow, which was a, a town not too far from Springfield, Massachusetts, which some people might know because of the basketball hall of fame and whatnot. And it was a huge immigrant population, tons of Polish people, tons of Portuguese people right off the boat. So even till this day, people are like, how has your dad been in this country for so long? And he still doesn't speak as good of English as you expect him to. And I'm like, because he's never really had to. He goes to Portuguese butcher shops, Portuguese bakeries. He's worked for Portuguese people most of his life until he worked uh, for him, himself. And even when he worked for himself, that was kind of the deal was that my dad would be out in the field taking care of that stuff. And then he would have a partner that would be a little bit more book savvy and, and savvy with the language, which also made it easier to kind of for him not Make to know what off. the hell was going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was trying to be nice, but you're right. Yeah. You could kind of see where this story was going and yeah. So w without a doubt, but coming to uh, um, America and, and kind of, uh, just seeing the whole capitalistic kind of a, a, a world, you know, I think something you talk, I, I'm not, now I'm getting, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit. I'm moving into something. Your, what was your question before I, I continue this thought and go somewhere where maybe. No, please, please continue. Cause I think it's your background and how you got into all this stuff and, and what you bring to it. You're cause what you're kind of talking about, I think is part of the perspective that you bring, whether it's explicit or just kind of baked into it, you know, it's cool. You have a different, a different perspective. It's a, 
it's a first generation kind of perspective kind of guy. And yeah. So, so we, I end up working construction with my father. We had a small business uh, with the family. My, my brother and I decided to help my father out with the, with the book stuff and, and all the stuff that he was uh, kind of restricted to. So we would handle anything that he, he couldn't do in regards to reading, writing emails. And as time went by, we started in 04. So it was right after high school. Well, I graduated in 03 and it, it, we started in 04. And at that time, really, I mean, you could kind of get away with a handshake and, and there was, there wasn't nearly as much paperwork as there is now. Now it's like, I spend so much of my time in the office, just catching up with paperwork and certified payrolls and all this, you know, uh, submittals and all these requirements, uh, working for the state. And that's a whole nother conversation. I mean, working in Massachusetts, it's such a headache. I mean, it just so much paperwork. So, and, and this really kind of highlights some of the issues that a lot of like libertarians talk about how governments and, and a lot of a, a lot of what they do really just gets in the way, you know, and you can kind of see that. And it really benefits the bigger companies because smaller companies like us, we have to do all the same amount of paperwork and deal with all the same certificates and requirements. But we have a, a small office. It's me, <laughs> you know, so it's like I don't have a lot of help. And, it, you know, this is all stuff that doesn't really it, it you don't you don't make any money doing it. It's just stuff that you have to do to eventually do the work to, to make you money. But anyway, so to make a long story short, that's kind of the world that I got caught up into. I was a musician initially. And then as you get older and things like work and all these other things get in the way, the band just became impossible to keep together. It was just impossible. And it was I'm one of those people that I'm kind of an OCD. And when I start a project, I I, I don't like all I do is think about it and, and think about how to expand it and how to make it the best thing ever. And when people aren't investing the same amount of mental energy and effort, you kind of get discouraged. So I started doing music on my own. And this was uh, right. At, you know, I started doing it basically sometime after high school when the band broke up. But that got really hard too to kind of find time to do all that, produce a whole song on your own. All the music you hear on the Ripple Effect podcast is all my original music, but it takes forever to do that. It, it, it's time. I mean, it's super rewarding because as you know, anything that the more work it takes to accomplish something, the more rewarding it is after it's done. But, you know, I, I just, it, it, it really did get difficult to put out music at, at a rate that I, that was satisfying. And, podcasting was just one of those things that that I I really got attracted to because I was doing a lot of commuting for work and I'm like oh my god I love documentaries I love reading and I love learning I can do basically the, or, or learn the same type of things I was learning from documentaries and books but in the car I can listen to a conversation listen to really thought-provoking conversations that were were organic and to me that was like the really important part that i think people really liked was how organic podcasts were you know you turn on the tv there's agendas you turn you, you read a newspaper there's you know narratives that they're pushing on you so the, you i i always felt like okay the whole world is trying to sell you something and they have a narrative that they're pushing on you and podcasts were at least the ones that I, were, I was listening to. And I know there's now like corporate podcasts or whatnot, but the ones I, were, I was listening to seemed like a, a organic conversation, the type of conversation that you and I would have if we're at a bar and we're just bullshitting and talking and, and you know, it leads here and then it goes there and all these things. So it makes it to me that 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 was the appeal to it was listening to 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 real people just share ideas challenge ideas that's why you know i always said i i enjoy what you do in regards to your your willingness to to kind of push back a little bit because i think that is when you learn and you don't want to be in an echo chamber i i also think that's why the union of unwanted is such a pop, popular and unique show because we we do a little bit of everything we bring people from all different backgrounds and researchers and and different thinkers and we don't always agree but it's nice to to bring those ideas together and then see them challenge in real time and see people discuss them and agree and disagree because that's where you grow and that's where you learn. So I eventually got into podcasts, like I, like I said, and a after a while, 
I uh, I'm like, you know what? I have this recording studio. I have this uh, equipment. I know how to record vocals. I know how to use Pro Tools. It's a software I use for my music. And I'm like, why not start a podcast? And I had a co-host that I had to talk him into it. He's a little older than I am. And he's like, well, what the fuck's a podcast? And why would anybody want to just hear us talk? And I would tell him, like, listen, when we go out and we have these thought-provoking conversations where we would either share some personal stories or share some some really deep philosophy or something interesting that's going on in our lives or something interesting that we've read or watched. Uh, we enjoy those conversations. That's why we'd say time flies, right? You're you're talking, you're at a bar, you're at the gym, you're at the grocery store grocery store, wherever you are, if you have those type of deep conversations, the time just flies and you're, and it's really enjoyable. And I'm like, all we're doing is recording those conversations, sharing them with the world and hoping people enjoy them as much as enjoy listening to them as much as we enjoy having them. And the concept to, to him initially seemed so, because I guess on a surface level, the idea of just recording two people talking and putting it out there seems ridiculous. But when you really put it in perspective and you're like, okay, well, do I enjoy having these conversations? Do I enjoy conversation? Do I learn from conversation? Um, do I enjoy meeting somebody who has a really interesting thought provoking perspective and, and talking to them and kind of dissecting the way they think and, and some of their life ex experiences. Well, I do. Then why wouldn't other people enjoy that? And so it, it's really cool to archive those conversations and, and, and share them with the world. And as the ripple effect podcast grew it, one, it became a example of the ripple effect because the whole idea was, or at least the influence or the initial uh, thought was, to, to start a ripple, regardless how little or how large it might become, do something. Because I was kind of doing a, un and still kind of am, doing a unfulfilling job that really doesn't give me a purpose. And I felt like something was missing. And, and I've always been very artistic. So it also help, helps with kind of flexing that muscle and exercising that muscle of doing something creative. So it will, because again, uh, I think when you get older, you kind of get in a routine, you do a job and it becomes very repetitive and your thinking becomes repetitive, which I think it can be a huge issue too, which is why I think traveling or doing psychedelics or anything that gets you out of the same pattern of thinking is beneficial. Like just get yourself out of routine from time to time, do something that's difficult, do something that's different, do something that will just make you look at things maybe from a different perspective. Uh, but it, it gave me a sense of purpose. And I'm like, you know what, regardless if one person listens or a million people listen, I'm, at least I'm going to feel like I'm doing something. And then as I became a parent, it, you know, we talked about this when you're on my show, it was really interesting for me to think about my kids being able to listen to their father before becoming a father and and through the whole experience and listening i mean it's interesting for me to listen to myself years ago and just see where my ideas were and my thinking was and then see it progress i think it'll even bo even be more interesting for my children which you know they'll go back and be like okay what was my dad like when he first became a father what was my dad like when i was six when i was seven when i you know or what just seeing who he was when he was really young and I, I think that's that's all super interesting. And I think many of us deal with this issue of not having some sense of fulfillment or purpose, and we are just stuck in the system. And that's a whole nother conversation that we could, you know, also get into. I'm, I'm a big fan of Dr. Christopher Ryan. I think we might have mentioned him. Maybe we mentioned him when you were on my show, uh, who wrote Civilized a Death. He's been on my show uh, some years ago. And I, I just love this idea of questioning, like, what the hell is progress? And he, he uh, Christopher Ryan always says this. He's like, if the winners, right, if the game is financial and getting all these material things, which is basically the, the, the goal of most people, and it's a goal that's not really something that's internal that we've decided this is what we want. I think it's a lot of it's society and marketing, you know, Edward Bernays and propaganda, all these uh, techniques of getting you to want things that you don't actually need. I think it convinces us that like, okay, if I go down this road of getting all these things, then that's what success is. And that's also what leads to happiness. And I think many of us go down that road and find out like, okay, I'm not happy still, what the fuck's wrong? And then you start self-medicating or you end up um, just trying to, to find purpose or, uh, 
if you don't end up finding purpose, you end up depressed and 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 full of anxiety, and uh, it leads to a bunch of issues. So I think it's really important for people to find something they love, pursue it, even if it's not financially. A a um, it's not a a good idea in regards to finances. Do what what you enjoy. My my parents are old school, like foreigners who grew up on a farm and and came to America to financially get ahead, and. I remember always arguing, not arguing, but like butting heads with my mother on anything I wanted to do that didn't get me financially ahead. It was like, well, you know, what if you get hurt playing basketball? What if you get hurt playing soccer? What if you get like, what do you, are you making any, like the first question at any time I do anything and I'm, I'm a little bit proud of like, oh, I, I released my first podcast. You know, the first question out of my mother's mouth is, oh, are you making any money doing it? You know, oh, I released uh, uh, some uh, music, uh, first solo music. Oh, great. But are you making any money doing it? You know, it's like all it's always like and I think a lot of it's like the the immigrant mentality of you come from a, a place where you were poor, you had no running water, you came to America, took this giant risk to get ahead financially. And then there's maybe some of that because my wife has a grandmother I would talk to a lot about um it, she she grew up during the Great Depression. She she passed away uh not too long ago, but I remember talking to her and it always seemed like because she went through such struggles, there's always, she was almost traumatized by those struggles and she was always concerned about possibly going back to that place. So now she was like, even though, you know, she's a good saver and she, she worked her ass off her whole life. So money wasn't really an issue. She always, you would never know it because she was always acting like money was the issue by, you know, trying to find every place to, to save money or whatnot. And I almost think, the anxiety of of money growing up because when i came to america and, and believe me i was i wasn't poor to to uh the extent that some people were poor you know where you you don't have food and water or whatever um i mean i had the necessities growing up but i didn't have anything past the necessities i didn't you know i had to hand me down clothes i had all so and and money was always a topic that I remember my parents just stressing about, like, how do we cut corners here? How do we save money here? Don't spend money there, you know? And I think it, it even internally, subconsciously somewhere, it caused a, uh, a relation where like money was, I always had this relation of like negative feelings. It was like anxiety, uh, fights, arguments. Um, it was so uh, growing up, like I almost went in the other direction where I'm like, I want to not think about money at all. I'm like that artist where I'm just like, I just want to do what I love and just hope things fall into place and not have money be in the back of my head all the time, influencing every decision I make and everything I do. And, uh, you know, one thing I, I always tell my friends, it's, uh, it's like you can make more money, you can't make more time. You know, time's the most valuable thing. And it's like if I'm out, you know, on vacation with my kids or, you know, out to eat with my wife. And we're like, fuck it, we're going to drink a little too much and we're going to get a hotel. You know, this is before kids when we could do spontaneous things like this and get a hotel and and maybe overpay for the hotel because we want to have a good time tonight and we want to be responsible and, and stay locally and not drive home. Fuck it. Let's just have a good time, you know, and that was always like I'm like, I can always make more money later, you know, and, and so all these things kind of factored into my thinking. And, you know, now I'm going into a bunch of just childhood stuff that I think, you know, just influences who you become and who you are, which is, uh, is always interesting, you know, just like going back and reflecting on your childhood and then trying to figure out, okay, what had a negative or positive effect on me or what influenced me that, that, that molded my, my way of thinking and my thought process now. And I think we all, we all have that, right. We all have things that we can look back at and be like, okay, I think that had a bit bigger impact on me than maybe, you know, anybody thought would at the moment, you know, so it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's all, you know, it's all part of kind of, you know, putting those pieces together and figuring out yourself and figuring out the world around you, which is, I guess, the goal of my show and the goal uh, of all of it. I, I think it's similar to your show. One thing I love about your, your show is that you, it's those big questions that you talk about. And I think those big questions aren't asked enough. And I think we're both very similar. I've heard you say this too, about how you're not a religious person. I'm not either, but I appreciate the fact that religious people do ask those questions or people who are in the philosophy ask those questions. And I think that there's a lot of people who are just robots going on with their day and never ask those questions. And sometimes it's too late by the time you realize like, 
maybe I should be asking those questions because I've been living a life without purpose or I've been unhappy and I've been masking it with this or that. And um, so I, I, yeah, I think podcasts are absolutely important because if you don't have religion, if you don't have a church, or if you're not interested in philosophy, maybe you might listen to a podcast that might help you um, self-reflect a little bit and, and ask those, what I think are super important questions. Tell us about the union of the unwanted and tell us in particular, you know, when I talk to normies and I talk to a bunch of normies on my show too, and I, I don't want to claim like, you know, that's like a, a complete goal of the thing, but it, it just turns out to be, I mean, I talked to who I'm going to bring him up on the screen. I talked to Scott Shea. What an interesting conversation. Guy's probably a billionaire or close to it. Started a huge bank in New York and just wrote a book on uh, conspiracies in academia. But he's just focused on conspiracies against uh, Jews and anti-Zionism and, and we Zionism. And we had a really interesting quote. He was very good because I really challenged him on that. But he was really able to kind of be there. You know, uh, Pam Popper, we both just talked to recently, and I think we could talk about that in particular in has, how it has to do with science. But who else? Oh, these people, you know, Sarah and Jack Gorman denying the deniers. These are two people that have PhDs from Columbia. Uh, Jack is still teaches at Columbia. And I guess the reason I, I bring it up is, you know, what the union of the unwanted does that like these normies that I'm talking about, those people that have been on the show, and I could go through all the list, you know, Riz Virgo, I could go through the last 10 people that I've had on the show. Eight out of 10 of them would not understand the basic purpose, the need for union of the unwanted. The I, They don't really get, and I guess I wanted to kind of bring this up and, and have you talk about it because you have personal experience with this. Being banned, being banned for no fucking reason. You're interviewing a top virologist recognized, you know, in medical journals, and you're being banned because you're interviewing that guy. This is to, to like you and I and the people you have on the Union of the Unwanted, it almost just kind of rolls off your back without even thinking of it. But I want you to speak for a minute at that kind of basic level so people get a sense for who are the kind of people that are being snuffed out of the dialogue and systematically just remove removed from a scientific discussion you get you get the whole thing of what i'm saying right yeah well I, I was recently banned on youtube the funny thing is uh we use uh youtube tv at home when they canceled my youtube channel i couldn't i found out because in the morning youtube tv wasn't working and i'm like what what's going on here you know i, I went to go put on the tv and it wasn't working and then i found out that my channel was canceled or deleted and uh and then they still charged me for youtube tv and i had to like contact them like listen you guys you don't everything that was under that gmail account i had no access to anything like they just basically like no you don't exist and um so we end up you know uh, obviously i had to create a new gmail account for now i have a youtube channel with clips or whatnot but the stuff that i was getting flagged for was and, and getting in trouble for were stuff with doctors which is kind of surprising because i'm like they're going to get me for when i have maybe a researcher who doesn't have a doc you know doesn't have a phd somebody who who doesn't practice medicine that would that would make more sense you know but when you're specifically going after you know i think dr carrie madey was one um dr robert malone i mean all these doctors i had on and their shows were being flagged and actually the first show that got flagged i believe was kevin sorbo Hercules, which was hilarious because I'm like, OK, well, I didn't think he said anything too controversial, but um, but they're picking and choosing what narrative you're going to be able to see. And they're I mean, it's so deep when you think of the analytics, the information that they gather, all the great minds and software that that they have. They know exactly what they want you to see, how it affects 
who you are and what you become and how you think. So it, it's it's scary. You know, it, it is scary. But the censorship issue, this is why when I went to Rockfin, initially I was because I, I truly believe in the idea of of open source. Right. I'm a big fan of James Corbett. When when uh, way before I started my podcast, I was a fan. He was one of the first guests on my show. And I love this idea of open source. Like, I don't care if I get the clicks. I don't care if my website gets the clicks. Put put the information anywhere you want, upload or whatever. And I'm like, I love that because it, it it shows that he's about the message. He's about getting these conversations out there. He's not about, um, you know, making money. And if he and, and he takes donations, obviously, you, 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 if he can make money, he can do it full time, which he ends up uh, doing. And, and that's one of the reasons we get the product. But he had faith in the people that were getting value out of his product that they would contribute. And, and that ended up being the case. But, you know, so these alternative platforms, I, I, you know, I never monetized on YouTube because I was always concerned about like kind of, you know, for a lack of a better term, being a business partner with with YouTube. I'm like, I never monetize. I always age restricted my stuff. And I think I went under the radar for a while. I remember when Dr. Robert Malone was on my show, he he contacted me like a, a day or two later. He's like, how the hell is our interview still on YouTube? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, honestly, I'm like, I feel like I'm going out under the radar and it's okay. And I don't know if the al- algorithms were, were confused too, because I would have somebody on like professor Richard Wolf, who's a, you know, socialist and, and Marxist scholar and, and, you know, uh, goes on shows just to talk about those topics. And I would have a Lee camp on who's, uh, you know, a, le- a left-leaning, uh, like progressive comedian. And then I would have somebody on like Roger Stone or whatever. So I don't know if maybe there were sp- because you look at the QAnon people or the like the real hardcore Trump people, they're the ones who were eliminated first. And I'm like, so I, I kind of had a little bit of hope that I'm like, maybe I'll go under the radar, not because I care about YouTube. That's the other thing I want to emphasize. It's because shows like yours and other shows that are still on YouTube that go against the grain, like it's they're necessary because the people who are going on Rockfin or Odyssey or BitChute or Rumble or any of the other websites you can find the video version of my episodes, there are people who most likely already have similar views or are at least intrigued with those uh, alternative perspectives. But there's a lot of, you know, I'll use your word normies. It's it's true. There's a lot of people out there. Fall, it's not a fall of their own. Like they might have never been exposed to something that truly shattered their their worldview and if i can reach a couple of them on youtube because that's unfortunately the the majority of people when they're searching for information they're using google one and they're using youtube second it's the second biggest search engine in the world so to be able to reach some of them would would be good i think it's a good thing and and it's necessary so it's a shame that they're getting rid of everything i mean obviously it's not about money it's not because there's some big channels that have been removed off youtube that i'm sure make them some decent money i mean you look at um what's his name um uh the the right wing uh show uh crowder he he was uh you know another guy who's been getting in trouble and fighting with youtube i mean his show it's a huge show i'm sure they make youtube a lot of money so it's like it, it, it's obvious it's not about the money it's about the narrative it's about a greater agenda and, uh, and the Union of the Rwanda came from that because what happened was, even though I wasn't banned until recently, I would get warnings from time to time on my YouTube channel. And a lot of other people that were friends of ours, especially during 2020, were getting banned or censored or deleted off all the major platforms. So uh, it was a- it actually came from the origin of the Union of uh, Unwanted came from like, I always enjoyed doing swap casts. If you go back in, you know, in my archives, you'll find a lot of shows where I'll, I'll combine a couple guests and just because I think we can all bounce things off each other and it would, it would lead to really interesting conversations. So I was always a fan of those. And then I ended up being on Mike's OBDM show and Charlie, it's like, Hey, you were just on my favorite show. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I love the OBDM. I'm like, how about you? Like, you know, I we all do a show together. We'll do a swap cast. And he's like, oh, that'd be awesome. And then we decided to do a swap cast. Then I'm like, hey, let me email a couple people and see if anybody else wants to come. And we'll do like a, a, a hangout show. And uh, funny enough, the only person who I emailed out of like, you know, a handful of people was Sam. Sam was the only one. So it ended up being us four. And so it's funny how things work out because it's like if this little thing turned out slightly different, would 
would I be here right now? Or would this show even have been created? So San, because maybe if it was a big turnout, you know, if everybody I emailed showed up, maybe, you know, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have had the chemistry and decided as a group to, to continue this thing. But Sam was on the show and the Sam four of us AAA, just so people yeah, Sam know. AAA from the Tinfoil Hat podcast and the eight million other shows he does. But he uh he also has Zero, a spiritual podcast, and a bunch of uh, other shows. But we're all talking and we're talking about the censorship issue. And and Mike says, Yeah, we're kind of like the union of the unwanted, you know, and that's what where it came from. It was like we felt unwanted from the major platforms. And immediately we're like, I don't know what we're gonna do with that name, but Mike, hold on to that name because that's a great, that's just a, it has, it has a great ring to it. You know, it could be a name of an album or a band or something. And I think he bought the URL while we're on, uh, while we were recording, which was pretty funny. And so he ends up buying the URL and then, and then we're, we're in a group, uh, text message talking, the four of us. And I was like, Hey, we should get, do a show called the union of the unwanted. It was going to be like a episode that was going to be open source. This goes back to like I, what I mentioned about my love for open source. I was telling the guys, I'm like, let's make it open source. Let's get all these people together in an alternative media world. Let's get them all together on a, like a zoom conference call and we'll make it open source. So everybody can share the, the episode on their platforms, call it the union of the unwanted. And it would be a specific episode. And then we did our, our first, like official union of the unwanted show with the, which I mean, Ben Swan was on there. I mean, so many, uh, James Corbett was on there. Uh, so many great, uh, people from the alternative media community. We got them all together and we talked about solutions and what we're dealing with. And, uh, and it was awesome. And we, I, I loved it. And I've, I've always been a people's person. Like I love meeting people. I feel like everybody has a interesting story or interesting. Well, I shouldn't say everybody. Well, there's some tough people out there that are too fascinating, but there's the, the majority of the time. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised that people are much more interesting and fascinating than I initially think in many cases. And so I've always loved meeting people and talking to them. And I remember even when I was single, like going out, um, my friends would think I was kidding, but like, much of the fun of being single and meeting girls was like hearing their story. And, and they would always like, think I'm, I'm like just busting their balls. Like I was making a joke. I'm like, no, no, I actually care about like where they're from or, you know, the, how they were brought up and all that stuff. So, um, so it was a perfect fit for me. Cause I'm like, I love the union of unwanted. I get to have a bunch of people together, talk to them, meet some new people, uh, have on old friends and have them, you know, meet other friends. And it became like a community. And, what I was seeing a lot when we would bring people together. And the cool thing is like, Mike's been doing podcasting for a long time. I've been doing uh, podcasting for a long time. And Charlie's, he had a book, The Octopus of Global Control, which um, got he got to know a lot of podcasters and people in the community. Sam's been around for a while too. So we all kind of, we're all similar in regard. It's funny how different we are, but one thing that I've told the guys is I'm like, the one thing that makes us all very similar. And I think one of the reasons why it works is that none of us have labels. Like we're not like a conservative guy or a liberal guy or a whatever. Like we just like meeting people and exploring ideas. And because of that, I think you look at our track history, people like us and people were willing to come on the show because they didn't feel like they're going to get attacked. They didn't feel like we had a agenda because they knew us as, as people didn't have agendas or we weren't trying to spark debates for the sake of debating or making somebody look bad. So having that, that uh, great relationship with people with all the guests that have been on my show throughout the years, I, I, you know, I just started booking people and I started bringing like just interesting people in and it just kept growing and it was cool because it almost like self-marketed itself because the whole open source thing initially i i pushed this on the guys because one that's what i do with my show i tell people like post it anywhere you want it, I, I'm, I'm on a lot of alternative platforms and sometimes other people with my shows on their channel have more <laughs> subscribers and more views in my show but i don't care because at least they're get, getting exposed to the 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 conversation which is the most important thing so but it started self-marketing because what would happen is that you know monica perez or the truthzilla crew or whoever it might be when they're on we send them the links and we're like you can share it on your platform and so people who might not know what the union don't want it is 
they end up hearing it on some other platform and people would talk about it and and whatever. So it just kept growing. And then you'd see a lot of people connect after, after the show. That was one thing I, I really liked was that after the show, you would see two people that were on the show interview each other. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is really creating a community. So it was, which is why I've pushed back a, a little bit. Like there's been a, a little bit of a internal conversation about like, hey, you know, um, should we do ads? Should we do, you know, and it's kind of just been thrown out there. And I'm like, I've always, I'm, I always feel like I'm the jerk who kind of pushes back against it a little bit, just because I, I love the idea so much and what it's become and how it's helped other podcasters. That's like another thing is like, if you go back in our archives, one thing I, we consciously do is that we'll look for a up and coming show and we'll, we'll give them opportunity to get a platform. I mean, at one time, Truthzilla was that. I remember, I remember them emailing me or writing me wherever they wrote me uh, about starting a show. I'm like, yeah, yeah. If you need any advice, I'll help you. And I, and I mean, there's plenty of podcasts out there. I mean, many, many podcasts that I've, uh, I've told them the same and, and, you know, I'll tell them like, this is how I record and this is how I post. And I use Podomatic, uh, to post my shows and, and all this other stuff. And, uh, so I help out any way I can. And then to have them come on and you don't want and give them that little bit of a bump. I mean, it's not that the show's huge, but it, it's big enough where it does help these smaller shows. And um, it, it makes me feel good. Like, you know, I've had people say that we're, you know, I'm kind of like the Joe Rogan of podcasts or the alternative uh, community because Joe Rogan's always telling people, start a podcast, start a podcast. And on my show, I'm always like, start a podcast, start a podcast, I'll help you. And uh, so it, it really, it, it's become something bigger than any of the hosts or even any of the participants. It's like, it's a community and people people love tuning in and seeing who's going to be on there next. And it's funny because people will always ask like, who's going to be on the show? Like even participants will be, and I'm like, honestly, I can tell you who I asked to come on the show, but it's so random. And it, I, I actually love that aspect of it because I don't know if you've had, you know, how your group of friends are Alex, but when I go out with my friends, we would always have this issue where it's like, it's not an issue, but we'd always kind of joke about how you have the friends that get there early. You have the friends that, uh, get there late. You have the friends that said they're going to come that don't come. You have the friends that didn't sound like they were going to come that end up showing up. And it's fun. You go out, you have a couple of drinks, like, Hey, we're meeting at this bar come or we're meeting for dinner or whatever, if you want to join us. And it's, so it's always random. You don't know who's going to walk in the door and be like, Oh, I haven't seen this guy for a while. Like, how you been? I didn't know you were going to show up. Like that's kind of how the union don't want it is. And it's like purposely that way. You know, sometimes I'll just throw out, a, you know, back in the day, I used to throw out tons of emails. I'm like, listen, like if you want to show up, I'll, I'll let me know and I'll send you the Zoom link. Or sometimes I would just send a Zoom link, even if it, I'm like, here's a Zoom link. Even if you said you can't make it, if you want to drop in for a little bit, drop in. You know, you even if you're late or whatever, don't worry. And some of those people who said they couldn't make it eventually drop drop in because they don't feel any pressure to have to be there from beginning to end. And um, so it just, I don't know, it just it really is a blast. It's one of my favorite shows to do. It's it's fascinating. It's uh, personally, you know, and I don't speak for the other guys personally, I really enjoy the conversations like last night and like many of the uh, other shows we've done where it's on a little bit more serious topics and it's, we get to kind of just get a lot of different people from different backgrounds and different researchers and bounce ideas off each other. And you never know how one person can contribute or not contribute. Sometimes we'll be talking about something and you think a, a participant would have nothing to include on that specific topic. And they do have something to include because they've done a little bit of research that you weren't aware of, or they read a book that you didn't know that they read that, uh, you know, so they have a little bit of insight on that topic. So I, that whole, just the, all the wild cards and all the, you don't know what's going to happen or what's going to be brought up and who's going to get along and who's not going to get along. All that is what makes it exciting. And weirdly enough, we've never had an issue really with like people talking too much and having like really like shut somebody up. We've never had an issue with people being um, disrespectful. Uh, it is funny because I was talking to Charlie about it not too long ago about I, I've had, ha made some questionable decisions. I remember right before election time when like people were really emotional and politically like worked up. Uh, I had Greg Palace join us uh, on a show um, with some notable people that were like super MAGA and I'm like, I should have known it was going to turn up probably not great, but I'm like, 
it, they they turn you know i'm like i think most people will be respectful and they were like i they were but there was a little bit of butting of heads and i think some people who are kind of new to to the alternative media community they don't realize that like greg palace is really really a og in regards to um you know this world and even though i disagree with him on on you know probably quite a few things you can't take away from some of the great work he's done his uh journalist work in regards to uh just everything from the oil spill to so many other uh corruption stories throughout the years and um so i think you know bringing anybody and same thing when i had uh, roger stone on uh, nobody knew Roger Stone was going to be on. Uh, I, I try not to disclose who's going to be on because then you're always like a little worried that somebody will be like, OK, um, oh, I want to be on this show because he's on or they'll spread the word and then they'll share the link or whatever. So that's why we also change the link every episode. You know, I'm, I initially I, I think somebody proposed like, oh, are you guys going to use the same link? I'm like, hell no, we're not going to use the same link because in one episode we'll have like 400 people, you know, if, and people will just jump on. So. The whole thing is is just fascinating and exciting. And during 2020, I think the other thing that was super, super important and we get a lot of positive feedback about is that a lot of people who felt like they're going crazy, that like nobody in the world was seeing the facade and seeing the illusion. They listened to the Union of the Unwanted and there'd be people from the, you know, the UK, you know, just like last night, people from all over the world, different continents or wherever. And you're like, holy shit, I'm not alone. Like there, there's a huge group of people, just podcasters and alternative media uh, people and researchers that feel the way I'm feeling and seeing the things I'm seeing and realizing it's not making sense. And I think it gave them hope. It gave them hope. It gave them community. It, uh, I think one thing you hear a lot in from podcast listeners is that some of them don't have the friends they can talk to about maybe the deep questions and, and uh, uh, conversations you might have on your podcast. So when they tune in to Skeptico, they feel like they're having those conversations they want to have. They feel like they're they're a part of those conversations that they enjoy. And it gives them it, it almost like it, it's it's almost weird because we do so much talking and we record so much of it that there's people who really know us really well. There's I mean, we all have listeners that are hardcore fans who listen to every episode. And they probably know me better than I know myself because because there's probably things that I've said in the past that I forgot about or ideas that I've had um, that have changed that I'm not aware of. And, uh, you know, you meet those people. They know like they feel like they know you, but you have no idea who they are. So it's always like this weird relationship. Um, sometimes I have people write me and I'm like, this person really fucking knows me. This guy really listens to all, you know, all my shows and um, and I have no idea who they are, you know, so but they listen to my show and they feel like we're friends. And I like that. I want to be their friend. I wish I could be everybody's friend. And, and, and I'm glad that they feel like that. And I think that's one of the powers of shows like yours and mine and all the shows that really embrace conversation, because I think conversation is one of the most powerful things in the world. Uh, I think, you know, you can look at, you know, whatever, you know, whatever uh, historical document, you know, the, the, the founding fathers were debating things, probably drunk and half in the bag at a at a at a bar, uh, at a pub, having a drink and 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 debating and conversating and challenging each other, and um, and and coming up with solutions and challenging those solutions and 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 talking about issues and so so much comes out of it and I think verbalizing your ideas and verbalizing how you feel sometimes you also find flaws in them right like so when you're being interviewed uh, I, i've seen it it's happened to me quite a few times where i'm being interviewed and i get asked a question and in the process of me a, uh, answering the question i realize like i'm not really strong on this opinion and i'm changing it as i'm describing it or i just say sometimes i don't know and i'm not sure which i think is completely okay too and i don't think we do enough of because the ego gets in the way of that. And I think sometimes the ego says, oh, it's a sign of weakness if you say you don't know. It's a sign of weakness if you say you're not sure. Or it's a sign of weakness if you're not, you don't have a strong belief on something. And I don't, I, to me, anybody who's too sure of everything they say makes me nervous. Cause I'm like, you can't be sure about all that, you know? And it's like, are you really, do you have blinders on? Are you, is there, is there some flaws in your thinking? 
so it's um i think as you get older you, you you're much more open to the idea of not knowing and you're much more open and you accept it and you embrace it and you know it's like that quote you know the more you know the the the, the less you how does it go it's like the more you know the or you less... know you don't know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So yeah. So and and I think that that happens. I mean, uh I, I think I've I've talked about it with so many guests on my show how much I, I love philosophy because it's asks those bigger questions that some people go to religion for, but without the the religious part of it, you know, the organized religious issues is just asking questions. And a lot of these questions are never really answered. I mean, it's debated over. I mean, the same questions are debated over and over again. And, you know, there's so many different philosophers who have different perspectives on, on so many different things. And, and even to, to the point where it's like, well, what's reality, what's real, what's truth, you know, all these things. And it, they seem silly at, at first, but when you really start, start dissecting it, you're like, you're right. You can make that argument. You can, uh, debate that you can look at it from that perspective. Uh, are you familiar with like Thaddeus Russell? He's another guy who I find really fascinating. I've had him on the sh show in the past and he wrote the renegade history of the United States. He's, he's another guy much like yourself that I've always enjoyed listening to because I know you, there, there's always maybe, maybe I'm, I'm trying like, how do I say this without sound like a, a like I'm, I, I enjoy conflict, but I, it's not that I enjoy conflict, but anytime I listen to you or or like Thaddeus Russell or any of these people who aren't afraid of being like, okay, I disagree with this person, but I'm not just going to politely, uh, you know, let them talk. I'm going to politely disagree with them and politely, you know, push back and and see where this conversation goes. And I think that's that's so needed. I think that is a problem with the union of the unwanted at times is that everybody is too polite sometimes. And if you disagree with somebody, then sometimes you keep it to yourself. But I want it to be a platform where eventually people realize like it's okay to disagree and nobody's going to get mad at you and nobody's going to hate you and nobody's going to not invite you next time because of it. We're here to, to share ideas and challenge ideas and also have our ideas challenged because I think it's really easy to point the finger and, and, and really, you know, question what other people believe but it's really hard to question what we believe and i've been talking for so damn long that um i should probably <laughs> let you expand on some of this well yeah I, I might because i i do think you know people need to tune in to the union of the unwanted and i pulled up on the screen for people who are watching it kind of what it looks like because it really shouldn't work as well as it does <laughs> like you just said you shouldn't be able to have 16 different podcasters that like to talk on a zoom call and have them do what you just described your your gift your and 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 charlie too we'll give him credit and sam as well but the the, the energy that you guys bring to this makes it work in a way that you wouldn't expect it to work and in particular that last point that you just made there ricky is I find to be very, very true. And that's that you do generate real thinking and counterpoints within a group without a lot of, uh, you know, dissension or confrontation or uncomfortableness, you know, which I, I know from my show, people are uncomfortable with uncomfortableness. It, it, there isn't a lot of that, but it isn't like everybody just patting each other on the back either. There's real discussion and uh, real dialogue. I think it's fantastic. I mean, I know I was kind of maybe stretching a little bit with the best hope for humanity, but it, it, it has great potential. And I, I can't help though, to return to where this sits in our current situation. You know what I mean? Because like, you're, you're given a really nice pitch. But you're a guy who got sucked into like the whole COVID thing on a very personal level with your family and uh, with your kids. And we talked about that on the last show, but it, it's easy to forget people who are directly confronting some of the change that's going on. And uh, I, I think you should talk a little bit about that, but I don't just, you, I don't want you to just talk about 
your story and where it's going. And you've actually continued to follow it. You've had like attorneys that have followed, filed suit in Massachusetts to say, you can't do that, which is what you told the school board when you went there. You said, you can't do that. They said, yes, we can do whatever the fuck we want. And then there's maybe a legal thing there. But what's really kind of dark, and you're kind of putting a, adding light to it, but I want you to give this the whole spectrum here, Ricky, is that when you see what is demonstrably happening, people are getting banned for talking to the doctors. People are getting banned for talking to an attorney who's filing a suit in the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, and the court is acknowledging his suit and saying, we'll hear it. And that's banned from the dialogue, from the public discourse, the great state of Massachusetts, founding fathers. We never, I've been at this a while. If you told somebody that 10 years ago, they just would have laughed in your face and said, there's no way we'll ever get to that point. And yet we're at that point. So maybe you can trace some of those steps into telling us about your story and in particular what it's led for you in terms of the ripple effect and the follow-on interviews done which are fantastic i love it it's like we're we're getting the inside uh you know look into your family and then how it's playing out yeah so so what you're referring to was and and this is something that i i would love to talk to you about because it it got on my radar the issues locally much more after 2020 because i i've said this before i've been so focused on international issues foreign policy geopolitics uh historical things that in my home state and in and even more personally in my hometown there were things going on that i wouldn't be happy with and i probably should have been more hands-on and, and more aware of and so after I had, it was actually, I remember this like it was yesterday. I, I had uh, Dr. Peter McCullough on my show, and then I get a text message from, or a message from some somebody who uh, is from this town, from my town, and they're like, you know, you should uh, go to the school committee meeting. And I'm like, what what meeting? They're, they're like, oh, they're going to vote on mass. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. I, I'm like, I definitely, I'm like, when is it? They're like, tonight. And so I am going to the meeting and uh end up uh you know i was nervous I, I know a lot of people think because you're you're constantly uh, go ahead were you gonna say something no i was just gonna say ricky fill people in a little bit on what you learned in talking to dr mccullough that you were going to share with the school board yeah well a, a lot of things i mean obviously uh, all the i mean but this is this goes into a another really important issue is we're almost at the point where the science, and it's funny because Justin uh, McCarthy, attorney Justin McCarthy, who was just recently on my show, which uh, you were referring to, he says this, and it's so true. And I've had other guests that have said this, like the science doesn't matter because, and what I mean by that is that it doesn't matter to a lot of people who are brainwashed. Like you could give them all the information, give them all the information that make that that would paint the picture that we've been lied to, that there's been suppressed um, uh, treatments that you know, all the things like the lab leak theory and gain of function uh, funding, like all this uh, information was being suppressed. All the doctors that had different perspectives were being censored. And in and, and many cases, they were being banned and deleted. And, and um, they were trying to uh, basically a character assassination. And you could give them all this information. And it's like, okay, any logical person would look at all this and be like, okay, there's something here. Like there's enough dots that it's really easy to connect them. But now it's so obvious of all these things and all the truths are slowly seeking into the mainstream narrative where now people are openly discussing these things, things that were so fringe. I mean, if you said that this was a bad flu in early 2020, people were losing their mind on social media, if you'd say that, if you would compare it to the flu. Now it's like publicly accepted that 99% of people will will survive it. And see, but Ricky, you know, hold, hold up, I got to pull you back a little bit, because I think you're getting too far ahead of the story in a way. And like, where I want to, I want to retrace these steps, because I, I encounter even in my own family, you know, people who are still walking that initial path. So you get on an interview with 
McCullough, right? That's his name? Yep, Peter, Dr. Peter McCullough. Dr. Peter McCullough. And you find, you get woken up to the mask science thing. And I got it from a different, uh, a different guy, but came to the same conclusion. They've tested these masks for a long time to see if they prevented the flu, and they always came to the same conclusion. Well, we don't exactly know why, but no, they don't seem to work as a public health policy. Don't worry about a mask kind of thing. And then the next step is, once you get past that, are they potentially dangerous? So we looked at, you know, whether they're beneficial, dangerous. But the part I don't want you to skip over, because I just hammer on this and people, I, the reason I hammer on it is because my show started with science. My show started with, as we talked about, Rupert Sheldrick and Richard Wiseman and like, hey, science will will win the day, you know, good evidence will win out and you will replicate your study and you will get a peer review and that people will pay attention and science matters. As our friend Charlie Robinson says, it's not about science, it's about compliance. That is where we're at now. It's not about science, it's about compliance. We just did a whole show on the Stanford and Yale mask study the, the biggest science lie I've run across since Sheldrick and Wiseman. It's a complete lie and it, it, it's attempt to do that. But the point, I guess I want, I want you to walk back to that point where you go, you're just being a good citizen. You're being a good dad and you're being like, Hey, well, I, I just found out some information. Of course, the school board would want to hear it. It's because it's not someone's opinion. I found science and we all care about science. We want to teach our kids science and science matters. And I'll go to the school board. There's a certain waking up process that I think you went through here that I, I you know what I mean? I want you to share that because well, some people I, I haven't gone the, through that yet. Well, I think the, the, the waking up part was the fact that there was no science I was going to give to school committee members. And that was that was kind of what I was getting into or without I probably made my response way too long. And people uh, I get just as lost as probably the listeners. But my point was that. All that science and all that information was never going to change their mind. They had their mind set. And what they do is they cherry pick the science or the information that helps defend their perspective. So it didn't matter how well researched I was or how much information I was going to bring to them. I mean, I had a little bit of hope initially because I didn't know who they were. And, uh, I, you know, some people told me that they were closed minded. But I, I felt like, hey, if I come here with enough logical information on how masking healthy kids because they're they're literally emailing everybody all the time like if your kid has any symptom whatsoever leave them at home so you're basically the majority of kids who are in school and i say the majority because there might be some kids who who might not have symptoms but you know might have uh the virus in their system and and this is they're you know what do they call pre-symptomatic so that that might be the case but i'm like so you're, you're masking healthy kids for the majority of them you're also masking people that are the least threat uh, of of being harmed by this virus. Uh, you know, and and you just go through all the information. I mean, it says on the box, the mask bo box, that it doesn't stop the spread of, of a coronavirus. There's no protocols, right? And this goes back to it's not about science; it's about compliance. Like, there's no protocols if my kid coughs in his mask. There's no protocols if my kid's at recess and drops his mask. OK, there's no protocols in regard. So let's make let's keep an eye, eye out on any kids who might, uh, you know, get their mask dirty and put it on their face. And the reason why that's so important is because the whole point of this fucking thing is to keep them healthy. And, and it's about health and it's about protecting the kids. So why wouldn't there be protocols, you know, something written out, some some steps that are taken to make sure every kid has a clean mask all the time? The truth is, it's not about any of that. And everybody knows and that most kids will reuse their mask over and over again. There's, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming there's probably kids. If I ask my kid, hey, do, does, you know, is there kids in your class that wear the same mask every single day, every week? He'd probably say yes. You know, do you think that's being clean and washed Absolutely every night? Absolutely, they are. So what happened? Tell us the story. What happens? You go to the school board and, and I got to I got to say, you kind of made the point i mean you went there at least with some hope yeah. some sense that that this 
this makes sense. You know, I played it out to my wife. I played it out to my, you know, sister-in-law, whoever it is. And they're like, yeah, gosh, I didn't know that. Go, Ricky, go tell the school board. They're going to want to hear this. They want to protect our kids. Well, yeah. And so I, I did. And, and I, I was pleasantly surprised that there was other people there who also were outspoken and, and upset about the whole situation. We end up pushing, they were supposed to vote that night, uh, eventually because of the pushback and, and kind of our, um, I think uh, our frustration and all this stuff, they end up because somebody ended up suggesting like, how about we ask the parents, like, let's do a poll. Let's ask the parents what they want. Uh, I wasn't too confident on the poll because I'm like, well, the majority of the parents probably watch uh, mainstream uh, media. So according to the information they have, the masking kids make sense to them. But I'm like, you know what? You know, maybe a poll is better than than because it didn't seem like we had the votes. It seemed like we were going to lose anyways. Um, you know, we, there's only one person up there that seemed to be kind of open minded to the idea. Uh, the other issue I really had was the fact that they were they were saying, we're oh, let's just start the year you know, with masks, which eventually end up being what the survey question was that they sent out to all the parents. They sent out the survey question for this poll stating that, are you okay with masking kids in the beginning of the school season? And I was rip shit. I mean, I ended up emailing all of them, contacting them. Like, this is not the survey we asked for. Um, I wanted you, what we wanted was uh, parents to have the choice. And if you want to, great. If you don't want to, fine. And the way they worded it, and I, I don't want to give them too much credit for understanding, uh, you know, Edward Bernays and, and ways to kind of uh, pull people in one direction or another. But they obviously worded it in a way, hoping that, you know, it seemed more innocent and it would be temporary, And I'm, which was bothersome because we asked them during the school committee meeting, like, hey, OK, if they do have masks for how long? And they couldn't give us an answer. And we're like, okay, what do you need to see? Like, what's the criteria? Like, do you need to see zero cases? Do you need to see a handful? Like, what what are you looking for? And they couldn't give you answers. So it was obvious that once those masks went on, they weren't going to go away. Um, So, but we did end up pushing for the poll. And then the following week was going to be the next school committee meeting where they were going to share the poll results and also finally vote on the masks. Well, this is it, it's bothersome because I, I really felt one, I felt defeated because I ended up putting up my own poll. I didn't like the way they questioned it. So I had my own poll going around. I created my own poll on change.org or whatever uh, website I ended up using. And I had, I think, just under 500 uh, signatures, some from some of the doctors and, and attorneys that uh, you referred to that's been on the show and um many residents from from town it wasn't just people from all over the place but it it was worded the way that it should have been worded about parents having the option and they should have you know that that choice and um and so i wanted i also send them the poll results i wanted to uh share my poll results at the school committee meeting and none of it mattered because the day it was either the day of or the, the day before uh, Massachusetts decided for every town and city in in the, in the state that they're going to mask all kids, even though there were some local towns and and many towns that decide not to. And uh, so, what the people wanted didn't mean anything, and it also took all the ability for us locally to make a, a difference and actually uh, push for something and stand up for something and and, and protect the kids. And um, yeah, so it, you know, I, as a parent, I felt defeated. I felt, uh, I felt like you know, I put all this effort and time, and you know, got people signing the survey, got people cheering the survey. Uh, you know, I had so many people contacting me about what was going on and thanking me for for being outspoken and all this stuff. And then out of nowhere, uh, Jeffrey Riley, who is um, I don't know, like commissioner, I forget what his title is, something about uh, education, one of the directors of education or something for Massachusetts decided him and, and dictator Baker to uh, mask all the kids. And we just got an email just a week ago um, saying that the, the the Massachusetts plans on masking all the kids till like mid January and or 80% vaccinated schools. If we have 80% vaccinated schools, uh, everybody in the school system, uh, 80% vaccinated, then they can remove the masks. The really absurd thing is nowhere in the email do they say anything about 
no cases or lower numbers like the numbers it's just it's so obvious the agenda is just to vaccinate the shit out of everybody and it doesn't matter um what the case it never mattered and that's kind of the thing about the the science that like i spend so much time talking to people and and so many people on a personal level if i'm talking to them at the gym if i'm talking to them uh wherever you know if i'm at a basketball game or wherever and i'm talking to somebody or at a, a little get together if we have a disagreement most people i feel like because logically logic's on my side if i just put this information out there and i explain to them how i came to these conclusions and and how obvious it is or at least if i don't tell them it's obvious but if i give them all the information it'll become obvious then they'll at least meet me halfway and so i had hope that you know that that would happen everywhere and i always felt like i could kind of sway somebody and wonder and you know the school the school committee members uh continue to uh you know i i um keep getting updates on on what's going on in town and after i i was outspoken and uh people were contacting me and talking to me about and you you as a parent i'm kind of curious on, on your perspective because this is kind of related to agenda 21 and agenda 2030 which we spoke about last night on you don't want it but they talked about all these like books with cartoon gay sex and all this stuff that's in the library in the middle school in in my town and how there's all these group of parents who are trying to get these books out of our library and then i run into like all these other parents that are having the same issue all over the u.s uh in their school systems with pushing critical race theory pushing um you know all these things that i'm just like is, are these things that should even be taught in school? Like what? Like I, it doesn't matter if 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 it's books with straight cartoons have you know doing sexual things. Like I don't care what you know gender they are. I don't care what sexual preference they have. Like my kids should not be exposed to this. This is a conversation I have with them. This is a conversation that uh you know th that they don't learn by grabbing the wrong book at the middle school, and so it it just all these agendas end up becoming more and more obvious. And you're starting to see how, like, these are all agendas that have been, I think, pushed. And, and there was like little baby steps, like this little move here, that little move there to kind of all push to the same destination. But now it's like, they're all much more obvious. And it, it's, it's scary because as a parent, you think about like, what world are my kids going to grow up in? And I remember saying this before I was a parent. I'm like, what world, if I had kids, what world would they grow up in? But now it's like, it's even scarier than what I predicted, you know, or at least when I was thinking of like the worst case scenario, like what world would they uh, grow up in worst case scenario? And now it's like, well, now the worst case scenario is way worse than I even ever predicted or could ever imagine. And it's just, it, it, it's scary. And I don't, I, I think these are topics that are hard to discuss because not on a surface level, the critical race theory or being open to, you know, people being gay, lesbian, transgender, like that's all, that's all fine and dandy. And I'm, I'm open to have those discussions. I'm not anti any of those things. I'm anti pushing I, any ideology on my kids like a school is supposed to be a place where you teach kids how to yeah, think but no. you know, hold on hold on ricky before you go yeah. on that role you know I, I think that kind of in a way it confuses the issue in that we've been talking about that shit forever right all my life you know that's been an issue and my kids are a little bit older than yours college kind of a little bit beyond college uh but that was an issue you know 10 15 years ago all that stuff what people want to know is, is it different now? And I think what they hear in your show is, no, it's, it's, it's demonstrably and significantly in an important way different. And I think you've been hammering on that pretty hard with where this whole thing has taken you. And it's really the, the, the one part, I guess, that I do want you to address because you kind of mentioned it and then you kind of rolled right past it. It's pretty dark right now and it's pretty scary because the natural through line of what you're painting only goes one way. It goes in this way of a, a control of thing matrix, I was going to say, but then that just throws everybody. It, it's just 
it's 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 scary in a way that even people who've been part of the truth movement, part of the whole thing for a long time, haven't had to really confront what they're willing to kind of do right now with it's like somebody brought this up the other day, maybe even on the show last night is like this step by step boiling frog thing that everyone's heard about, you know, it's like, you know, even if you just go back 18 months, remember when people said you're going to have a vaccine passport, you're going to have vaccine mandates. And I remember like, again, even in my family, they're like, that would never happen. You're just being ridiculous because you don't want now that isn't even that isn't even that's like just the beginning of it. So how bad is it? I, I try to be optimistic because I the more they push, the more I think we push. And I, I think it was you who said it last night. And I think it's so true. Like, don't fuck with moms. And it's 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 so true. Like throughout the years of, you know, so I to me, none of this is is that eye opening or new to me because I've I've always been really deep in in health and nutrition, and I've always been really deep into um, just big pharma and all those issues that are related to it. Uh, you know, early years of the Ripple Effect podcast, I had a lot of doctors on, Doctor Brzezinski, Doctor Gregory A. Smith, um, so many uh, great researchers that are really exposing how. You know, there's no money in in us being healthy. There's money in in symptom management and keeping us sick, and and I always had a lot of belief in in the human body and and its capabilities to to recover from things if you give it the fuel, and sunlight and fresh air and all the things that it needs to to be healthy. Uh, so, a lot of these agendas we kind of knew about, and now they they definitely seem fast tracked, uh, but. I, I also think it's woken up a lot of people like years ago when I would have conversations with people about vaccines, I mean, there are people, it was really hard to find other people who are skeptical about their safety or they're just about vaccines at all. And I know some of my listeners are sick of me saying this, but I would always use the metaphor of like, okay, if I give every kid uh, peanut butter, some kids are going to die. Like, so what makes you think vaccines are the one thing in the world that you can give everybody and nobody has a negative effect? Like it just, it, it seems silly. And I think a lot of people in the, oh, I guess, uh, medical freedom movement, we've been misrepresented because a lot of times it's, it, we're not saying that every person is going to be harmed from, from a vaccine. We're just saying that there's a, reward risk ratio and you've been misled about how much reward there is and how much risk there is and See, getting I think that that's the wrong i think that's the wrong debate and i think it's debate it's a debate that they would love to have because as you kind of alluded to you can get mired in all sorts of bullshit on both sides which is valid you know you got to have science and all the rest of that the, the question and well, this kind of came up in uh when i was on the ripple effect what no one wants to face is what we really want to know is, is it evil? Are the people behind this evil in some way that we're uncomfortable talking about, but we know what the fuck we're talking about. So when, you know, I was just watching the documentary, one of the documentaries on the kind of Purdue pharmaceutical thing and the whole Oxycontin thing and the family, you know, the, that whole, and what they did is they made, uh, I thought this was just, I'll throw this in as just a little aside, but they made pain a new sense. Like, you know, you have sight, you have taste, and now you have pain too. And you have the little person in the, you know, the little, you want to have the smiley face or the frowny face, face, which is all, you know, kind of really mundane and understandable. And like you're talking about the evil of the middle, it's like, well, of course there's some good and bad in there. All that was done as a marketing effort to introduce Oxycontin because they had this agenda and they sold billions and billions of dollars and they made all this money and they destroyed all these lives. We do not want to get pulled into another one of those protracted uh, medical discussions where there is always going to be that evil middle. What we want to understand is, is the, is the driving force behind this something that we could identify as 
good old fashioned evil. If it's just people out there and I see it one way and you see it another way, we can deal with that. If it's just somebody out there honestly saying, I think this is a better way to protect humanity and protect the herd. And well, I respectfully disagree. We can handle that. What we can't handle is whether there really is a, an overarching force in this that is the same force that we've been tracking in the truth movement for a long time. Those building seven wasn't hit by an airplane. Oh my God, what even bring that up? It's the same thing. Climate change and those phony emails never really happened. You live there in Massachusetts. The ocean isn't coming up. The best scientists in the world, you know, who've tracked the ocean level. There's no change in the ocean level. They continue to push that agenda. So I, I won't go on too long of a rant there, but the question is, is it evil? Is there evil behind this? Because I, you don't I, want to go there, Ricky. That's where I was pushing you. That's how I want to get skeptical. It's well, not about, right. it's not just about pleasant conversations. It's not just about everyone has an opinion and I'm going to start a commune in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Oh, even better. I got my seeds stacked up in the garage and, you know, I can last, you know, and well, uh, what kind of guns do you have? Because they are going to come to your door. Oh yeah, I got this gun and that gun. Fuck that shit. Obviously, none of that works because on the on some kind of grander spiritual level, that stuff just kind of looks as ridiculous as, as everything else looks. Unless we're really willing to go, you called it philosophical, I'd call it spiritual, and really tackle those issues head on. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? No, absolutely, it's evil. And I think that a lot of the people who are the most outspoken, the mo people that I've taught, Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Kerry Madej, Del Bigtree, Mickey Willis, all these people are spiritual or religious. And they're the ones who seem, and and, and I could go down the list. I mean, uh, Ryan from Last American Vagabond. I mean, all these researchers, doctors, thinkers, filmmakers, people who are really scared and panicking and feel like this is really bad. They're people who believe in evil. And I, I think there's a lot of like, I, I think there's true believers out there. I think there's so if you know, the people who are going to tell me to put my mask over my nose, like they're all not just a holes. Some of them are truly scared. The propaganda worked. You scare the shit. You, you attempted to scare the shit out of the population for 18 months. It worked on in, in many cases. There's a lot of people out there who truly, truly are afraid. They're the ones driving in a car by themselves. They're the ones who, even if you tell them that, like, hey, everything's good, you could take off your mask, they would probably still still wear them because it you've scared the shit out of them. That you've traumatized them to some extent. Where now they're so afraid of reality or getting a virus that you know, they'll wear one anyways, just to be on the safe side. Right. So uh, I think they're, they're, pe it's no different than somebody, you know, and fear and danger are two different things, right? It's like somebody who's afraid of an insect, you know, it's like, well, is that insect going to harm you? No, but it's not a, at, you know, it's not a danger, but it's fear. And, and for some reason you, you've been traumatized and you have this, this just over the top fear of something. And, I, and so I think there's true believers. There's some people who truly are pushing are helping the evil people who have a greater agenda, who aren't true believers in the nonsense that they're pushing on the public, but using these people as pawns. And you see it with like, there's people out there who truly care about the environment. And that's like the cause that they're the most passionate about. And they believe that there's, um, you know, we're putting chemicals into the water and all, and a lot of the stuff is true. What they, what some of them don't understand is that they're going to use those narratives and those issues to push other agendas and and so when they propose a carbon tax or they propose these things it's not because they truly care about you know protecting the world it's because they have other agendas and i think the only explanation is evil right i mean before hitler there was evil 
after Hitler, there was evil. You know, Saddam Hussein was a real person. Um, everybody always refers to to Hitler as like almost like he was the last evil person who wanted to kill everybody. I'm like, there's th- those people still exist. The only thing is we we live in North Korea. And what I mean by that is that people in the U.S. are just as brainwashed as many people or as everybody in North Korea were. You mold their worldview at a young age and you convince them that we are the exception to the rule. And I think somebody talked about it yesterday about the founding fathers and all this stuff. I think it's kind of true. I think they're in, I, I go back and forth because in, in one way, I feel like we're, we are a example of what could be right. Like a, a country that truly cares about controlling the the hierarchy and the monarchy or the you know controlling those in power and and making things fear and 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 having checks and balances where we can constantly make sure that we we filter out corruption but in the other hand i'm like we've been convinced of this and yet like somebody mentioned i think yesterday and i've mentioned it on my show all the time i'm like you look at who who ends up getting in office who who are all these politicians do a little background research. Guess what? They're all linked to powerful people. They're all linked to powerful families. They're all related to each other. They're all a part of these powerful, you know, uh, secret societies and groups. Like it's not us. It's 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 a hierarchy. So we have this illusion that we don't live in a monarchy, but yet the people running for presidents are always Clintons and Bushes and people who are skull and bones and and all this stuff. And, uh, and I think you know, that's only that's I, I get you. And that's a good point. Okay. It's only part of the story, though. You know, the I've been into American history lately, partly as a distraction to get away from. <laughs> but go look at Andrew Jackson, who interestingly is being pulled off of what the twenty dollar bill and being replaced by the woman who did the Underground Railroad. Well, hooray for that. I, I don't have any problem with that. I think maybe that's a good Andrew Jackson's really interesting character. Because Andrew Jackson, just brief digression into history, Andrew Jackson, genocide on the American Indians, no question about it, didn't have to set it up to do it that way, because it was the most expedient way to get the expansion that he wanted, and repeated it and the whole trail of tears thing and all that stuff. He's that guy. He's the guy who, uh, but he's also the guy who wins the War of 1812, which I didn't know this. I don't want to. I don't want to front like I know history because I didn't know any of this stuff. But you go ahead and learn it again. The War of 1812 is the second American Revolution, and we almost lost it. It was not a given. Andrew Jackson is a super patriot, and he drags the cannon and all the rest of this stuff through 25 miles of swamp to get to the 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 new orleans mouth of the mississippi there and he blasts the shit out of the brits and keeps him from coming up and partly because when he was a little kid he hated the he hated the brits because they arrested him when he was 14 years old and they locked him up but the point is we lose what the america is in america if andrew jackson doesn't do that and that's part of the reason he became president but you know what he also did He's the guy who really brought about slavery more than anyone else, brought Mississippi, Alabama, and he enslaved all those people. And I love how, you know, I don't want to do the whole wokeness thing, but there's always a truth to the wokeness thing. Like if you notice the language now, they say enslaved people, they don't say slaves. Right on to that. That's a good correction linguistically. They weren't slaves. They were enslaved people. Andrew Jackson enslaved him so he could make more money. And the only reason that the Civil War happened was because the abolitionists, the great abolitionists up in the great state of Massachusetts, they went down there and like John Brown is the guy. John Brown went down and he broke into the, you know, the where they have all the munitions and the guns. And he said, I'm going to start a slave revolution. We're going to, we're going to go do this. And John Brown gets thrown down, but then the South goes, fuck it, man. We've done everything we can to placate because they were just playing the game, playing the game, the middle game that you like to play conversations. Everyone has a voice, everyone they're playing that game to the max. And John Brown says, fuck that shit. 
The middle doesn't hold. Take a stand. Are you for enslaving people from the time that they're born until the time that they die? Are you for enslaving all their offspring forever? Is that what you're for or are you against that? And if you're against it, it's only going to come down one way and it came down the way that it is. So the, our history as you know, this great experiment, like you're, you're the one who brought up the American history, is extremely complicated. It is irreconcilable that, that we carried on that stain longer than anyone else in the world. I mean, Britain had given up on slavery. Every other de democracy in the world had kind of given up on slavery. We held on to it because it had an economic interest for a, a certain group of people. I don't want to get off too far on that, but I want to get off on it a little bit because Here's the point. Here's the last point I'll make on that. Andrew Jackson wasn't part of the aristocracy. You know what? He was the first uh, commoner to be made president. The evil that we're talking about isn't about uh, occulted secret societies. It isn't about bloodlines. It isn't about any of that shit. It's about something that we need to understand and explore and have a better handle on. It certainly isn't about Christianity. It certainly isn't in the Bible. It can manifest itself through what we can learn maybe in, in all, in so many great wisdom books, but it, it, Christianity isn't an embodiment of that any more than any other religion is. It's just another vehicle. So I've got, I've gone off on a long rant, but maybe you can bring it back home to the, to the history thing and how we deal with our complicated, complicated history and, and how we own it. And at the same time, deal with it as what we are going to be going forward. Well, I have a question for it because I'm, I'm kind of curious on your thoughts on there's some people who believe they subscribe to the idea that the U.S., the way that they created um, the U.S. The experiment, the way they were molding this experiment was for the purpose of having a fair system that, you know, had checks and balances. And some people believe like that was a facade and and really, you know, it was like this illusion that you had a, uh, a checks and balances and, and the system was fair. But it was there was always going to be some hierarchy for lack of a better term, what do you think? Do you think that like if the experiment was done correctly, like, cause you, I hear that argument from time, time to time where people will say they, the founding fathers had the right idea. We just messed up their ideas. We're not, we're not putting into practice exactly the, the way they envisioned the system working. Do, do you, do you agree with that? Or what's your thoughts? I'm kind of curious. It's complicated, right? I mean, we all know this part too, right? Like Thomas Jefferson is a slave owner and he's not only a slave owner, but he's, you know, the fact that you were having uh, sexual relations with one of your slaves, which is like so common, so, so common. You know, there was just this history, little factoid that came out. There was this woman who wrote kind of like Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, the famous guy who was born a slave and comes to be one of the leading voices of abolition and is meeting with Abraham Lincoln. It is probably singular, singularly most responsible for changing Abraham Lincoln's views on slavery because Abraham Lincoln starts out as we have to preserve the union first and foremost. And slavery, he was kind of this evil middle ground again. And Frederick Douglass and his relationship really changed him. There was a woman who also wrote an autobiography and for a long time historians were like that's too crude it can't possibly be true because what she said if you're a woman almost from the time you could you know be a little kid you were subjected to being raped by you know either your master or the all the chain that would go out there or leased out to someone else, which is what they did, you know, because you'll also hear this stat, people who want to whitewash that history and say, you know, and I have relatives who are uh, Southerners and there's a lot of great Southerners, but they don't want to own their shit a lot of times. It's like, you know, only 25% of people in the South even own slaves, stuff like that. Yeah, but they rented them out at a pretty high rate. So it wound up like just about everybody, whether it's, you know, the bring in the crops or whatever. The, the point being, that's what it was like to be a enslaved woman in America is constant 
constant rape or threat of rape was always at, at hand. So it's Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, are we going to take him off all the coins? Uh, you know, a lot of people have pointed this out, obviously, but George Washington had slaves. These people fucking knew better. Everybody knew better. You know, you can't enslave people. You can't do that. They knew that they were religious people, but they weren't real religious people. They just fixed it to what they wanted. But you know what? We all do bad and horrible things, and there's redemption for everybody. And I'm not saying that, you know, they have to live with that burden or that, you know, I have to live with that burden or you have to live with that burden. Certainly not, you know, it's it, it, because it's irrelevant. Take a look at it from a, a reincarnation standpoint, like I always point out, obviously you're being reincarnated. Obviously at some point you had black skin, brown skin, yellow skin, all that stuff is true. So don't get too, my thought is don't get too tied to that. But back to the question at hand is nothing's perfect, but it, it, it did seem like they had learned it, what it seems to me. And then I want you to answer that question as we kind of wrap up and talk about what's coming up on Yin Yin of the Unwanted and the ripple effect. But, you know, I think we have to respect the fact that the quote unquote founding founding fathers, which is even a charged phrase, they had learned some shit and they knew some shit and they tried to pass it on to us. And a lot of the lessons that they were trying to pass on, even like, I don't know about your dad, but like my dad used to tell me, you know, it, it, do as I say, not as I do. You know what I mean? Because it's hard to always do the right thing, but you do know what the right thing is to do. And I think the founding fathers, there's a little bit of wisdom in that. They knew what the right thing was and they tried to pass it along. And I, I, I think it, it's got to serve us now. It's our best chance. It's our, I don't know if it's our only chance, but it's our best chance against, again, people back to the thing, like you don't, you just need to reflect back what, what we started with is that you can't start banning people. You know, you can't, you can't be in the state we're at banning people, mandating stuff, so, not science, compliance, all the stuff that we're in the middle of that all us normies want to bury our head in. You can't comply to that and think this is going to turn out. That's where we need to return to that energy of the founding fathers. And they said, no. It ain't. If we don't do something, we will all either hang together or hang separately, as uh, the perv, our famous perv Benjamin Franklin said. What well, do you another, think? An another great example of what you're saying is MLK, for example. I mean, he was a womanizer. He slept around. He, but he seemed to know what good was, right? And and what being a good person was and loved one another. And obviously his, you know, I had a dream speech and all these things, you know, he, it seemed like his heart was filled with, with love and, and acceptance and forgiveness. And, and yet he wasn't a perfect person. And I think that's the story of humans, right? Like we all have flaws and we all, you know, and I think that's what, well, what's that quote? Like uh, the biggest trick, the devil, played was or that he he made people think he didn't exist right wasn't wasn't that yeah something along those lines i probably messed it up i messed up every quote so i'm sure i messed that one up but it, it's um w without a doubt like that i think that's a big part of it is that if you don't there's a lot of people out there and i don't know if it's a lack of spirituality or a lack of asking these bigger questions or searching for these bigger answers they truly don't believe evil exists and and it does seem like that quote as you know is true like it's like you've been tricked into believing that it doesn't exist and um that people who could knowingly do harm to others don't exist and i, I think war is is always an example i use because it's like okay you do know like we look back at vietnam we look back at um you know iraq afghanistan and everybody considers it a giant mess up and even and if you take it even further and you do some serious research into it it wasn't a accidental mess up it was a mess up on purpose and that means that there's people today 
who are dealing with PTSD. There's people today who has lo- who have lost loved ones. There's people today who have died. Uh, and and all this tragedy and horror and blood spill was all for nothing and based on lies. How is that not an example of evil? How is that not a similar thing to giving people a vaccine that you know could do harm to many? Like. The idea that we accept this thing, like we we know this happened, it's historically accepted that, you know, you look at the the weapons of mass destruction, all the, de- the deception that went into that. You look at the anthrax scare and and uh, you know where the anthrax came from and all that stuff, and and just kept people paranoid because everybody was freaking out. It's like, yeah, we got to fight terror. I don't know what that means, but yeah, we got to do something and keeping everybody's so anxious and scared that they make irrational decisions and they emotionally react. Right. So it's like super easy to be like, yeah, let's go into Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. I'm for Iraq. Cause I'm, I'm freaking out, man. I'm like, I'm afraid because we're at code red and there's anthrax in the mail and the towers came down. We need to do something. And you get people to emotionally react and that's what's going on now. I mean, it's the same thing, only instead of war propaganda, it's big pharma propaganda. And it's just, but it's the same idea. You, you're, you're capitalizing on people's emotions and you're scaring them. And I mean, there's been plenty of studies about how, how hard it is for, for us to think logically and make logical decisions when we're emotion or when we're afraid and, and your emotions are influencing. And, and I also think that it's, we all emotions are constantly playing a factor into uh, our, our thinking, you know, we, there's no such thing as a completely logical being that uh, doesn't have any other outside influences, you know, childhood stuff and, and other influences will, will have some type of effect on, on the way you look at information and the way you analyze information, dissect information. But without a doubt, I mean, I agree with you. Like we, the evil exists and once you accept that, I think it's much easier to accept what's going on. And and I think, you know, that's a huge issue is that people just don't, you know, people just, I don't know what it is. I, and, and, I, and I don't know if that's also a part of the, the agenda, right? Because that's something we've also been talking a lot about in the uh, alternative media community. And I've heard you say it too on shows uh, on your show about uh, atheism and and how you know this this pro science like everything's surface level explainable and and super any supernatural conversation is 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 um, childish or, or not worth entertaining. Uh, if that is either a part of the plan to to get people to just not believe in evil and not ask these bigger questions. Or if it's just something they're taking advantage of, I don't know. But e- either way, it's. Uh, do, you, do you have some comments on that? No, no. Go ahead. No, I was, I was. Just, yeah, I mean, uh, I just, I think it, it seems to work in their advantage in regards to pushing us in a direction that seem like that seems like we're being pushed into, and that's this idea of um, losing, uh, just losing some of the things that make us human and that's asking those bigger questions i don't know if you ever if you ever saw the i remember this video was uh years ago and i saw when they had two ai robots talking to one another and it didn't take long before they started asking where they came from and like you know asking those bigger questions and i think that's inherent in us i mean asking those bigger questions i mean to me i almost don't understand people who don't ask those bigger questions i'm like what do you mean you don't care or you don't or you've never pondered on this i'm like to me that's like that's so surreal like you're not here and and again i think when you look at the school system making us people who regurgitate information uh you you remove things from our lives that that provoke imagination and critical thinking and just make us just help mold little robots to just regurgitate information and this go back i know the rockefellers like they seem like they they get the blame for everything but in most cases it's true uh when you look at like uh schools and and you know teaching people how to sit down at a desk and and even the bell idea of having a bell when your shift is over, it, it it all comes from creating better factory workers. They want, I think, naturally, we're it's humans are not designed to be factory workers. We're not designed to be in front of a machine doing a repetitive thing for eight, nine, ten hours a day. And they were trying to create better factory workers. And um, it, 
Did you want to add to that, Alex? Well, no, I, th that one always gets me. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that just gets a little bit tricky. I, I mean, I get what you're saying, but like you have well, kids. Did. I have kids. We look for a lot of different ways how to do it, you know, and not nothing is perfect. I'll tell you what, as, as we wrap this thing up, do tell people uh, just really quickly what's coming up on the ripple effect and on the Union of the Unwanted, two shows that I really hope we'll have links up, obviously, but two shows I really hope people check out. Well, I I, I actually have a, a show with Dr. Jessica Rose I just did that I hopefully will be up sometime this week. And also a, a show I do every once a month, I do a show with my Patreon supporters. I uh, basically just, you know, share the Zoom link with them and, and I never know who's going to show up or how many people are going to show up. I just always cross my fingers that I don't end up talking to myself and, and luckily I don't. And so I, I do that. And then uh, I have a bunch, of, I would have to look at my schedule and see who's coming up. But I, I always look for, it, it's almost, it's good and it's bad. It, it's, it, it, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I've been focused on like, you know, medical freedom and medical, you know, and in this whole world uh, for, for so much, like so much of it's been uh, my focus. I mean, it's always been a focus of mine, but it's taken up so much of the show that I'm, I'm now from time to time, like looking for like the guests, like I used to were like, Oh, a historian or somebody else who, who uh, I can kind of, like you who said, you're looking forward to who do you have booked that you're looking forward to talking to? Uh, I would have, honestly, I'd have to. So there, uh, the reason why I'm I'm not aware of who immediately is booked just because it's I, I have a little break in my schedule. I know Aaron Franz is coming back on. He's uh he wrote he wrote the book uh, The Age of Tra Transition, and he also did a uh, great documentary back in the day. And I haven't I had him on like years ago, and he was talking about transhumanism. And at the time, it's like wow. Like I, I can see this agenda being played, but I'm not going to see the outcome of this. You know, I'm not going to see the finish line. And now I'm like, I got to get him back on because he was so right. And uh, in regards to a lot of this, but so I, I know he's an interesting um, interview. I'm sure I have uh, some, probably some more doctors coming on. Cause it's, it's something that I always love talking about. Um, and then you even wanted, I know uh, we've, we've kind of brainstorm, um, from time to time, we, we brainstorm some possible ideas for future shows. I know uh, Sam has suggested a, the, a show on the December 6th event because there's so many conflicting opinions and stuff like that and doing a whole show on on what we think happened there. And was there a PSYOP inside the PSYOP? Was it a PSYOP? What, what, you know, what happened? Um, and then also, I know Charlie's been uh, suggesting, you know, and I think it's a, you know, they're both great suggestions about doing a show on uh on food and and being the you know independent on in in regards to your your necessities and and how to take care of yourself and your family and uh, i mean when you're growing food you're growing you're basically growing money because it's it's stuff that you don't end up having to buy and you know what's in it you know it's not some um you know some really clever marketing uh label that says natural you know and uh, and it's like what the fuck does that mean natural you know and there's nothing natural in it and so it, I think we're going to maybe one of those topics might be next. Uh, I also like the general um, conversations like we had last night. So who, who knows? I mean, honestly, a lot of this stuff gets um, decided last second. It's it's uh, I know you've been on. I mean, for people who are listening, who might have not listened to a U union of the unwanted, you're on the most recent one. You're you've also been on a couple other ones. One that really sticks out is the. Um, near death experiences because that was a really unique and, and powerful show. And uh, I, I think that was, you know, that's kind of the beautiful thing of the union of the one you get those gem of episodes and uh, it, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't know any other show that's doing stuff like that, but the, the show wouldn't be what it is if we didn't have people like yourself and the other participants to come in who bring these really interesting perspectives, because uh, that's what makes it fun is that, all these very unique researchers and thinkers and bringing them together and, and just seeing what happens. Right. And, and is, uh, is always fascinating. So the umdonwanted.com, you can get all the, the links to our channels and audio and merch and all the places you can find our shows. And, and then the ripple effect podcast, uh, which, you know, Alex, you did a, a screen share of, and you can find all my episodes of everything i do uh ricky rants and rockfin which i struggle to do because i don't know if you've ever done a solo show 
um, I, I go through imposter syndrome right before I, I think about doing a solo show. And I'm like, what the fuck do I have to say or offer talking to myself? Uh, but I, from time to time, I do a show called Ricky Rants from Rockfin, which is a solo show. And then, um, of course, the Ripple Effect podcast, which is more of a personal one-on-one -on -one show like this. And then the You Have Done Wanted. And you can find them anywhere you can get audio uh, downloads. And uh, the videos uh, shows are, most of them are on Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, uh, Rockfin and all the alternative platforms because many of us have been censored on on YouTube because now in 2020 getting a second opinion from a doctor doesn't exist you know there, you have a uh, one opinion that is a uh, trumps all the other ones so it's definitely Ricky uh, um, rickyvrans.com or rippleeffectpodcast.com will bring you to the same website where you can find all my shows so it's an easy place to find all the links and, and episodes and uncensored thanks to to matt from content save i gotta give him a shout out because uh he he's the one who helped me build the website and uh protected me from from being censored because i really wanted a place where i could put all my work that bypassed any other platform because even though I, lo I love rockfin i love odyssey i love all these other platforms um they are businesses, private businesses. And, um, you know, so far so good, no censorship, no, no issues, but you, you never know. And, and so, uh, you know, um, I, I want to believe that, uh, that will stay the, the, the case for, um, forever. But like I said, you, you never know. So it's, it's nice to also be in control of your own destiny and, and give people a place where they can go find every show for free, uncensored forever. So, um, thanks to Matt for, for that. So, and, and maybe eventually we'll see you on, on, um, another you've done wanted or another oh, yeah. ripple podcast or a, uh, or on Rockfin or are you, are you on any of the other ones like uh bit shooter? I know you're, you're still on YouTube, but are you on bit shoot odyssey rumble float? Any of the other, odyssey, I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try, I'll try anything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, our Jeez. guest again has been Ricky Verandas. Do check him out. Uh, Ricky Verandas.com. Ricky, thanks so much. I, I I think it's so cool. I mean, I think you'll really turn people on. You have such a great style, and I think people really appreciate what you're doing. And I, I know that's why you're so successful, and that's why the union of the unwanted is so unique and so powerful. So I really hope people check it out. Thanks again, buddy. Hey, thanks, Alex. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the great conversation. Always thought-provoking, which is always what I'm uh, attempting to uh, get involved in some thought provoking conversations. So thanks, Alex. And keep up what you're doing. I'm a big fan. And uh, I think anybody who's as honest and outspoken as you, um, it, it, it's it's a good thing that it, you don't self censor or, you know, because to me, it's a sign that you're not self censoring, right? You're, I, it's almost the same appeal of Trump, right? It's like you might say some stupid shit sometimes, but I think what people really liked about him, it's like, well, at least I know he's, He's saying what's on his mind because he can't help but say what's on his mind sometimes, even if it hurt him, you know. So I think it it, it uh people like that organic, you know, conversation and that it's a real person. It's not a, you know, I'm not trying to paint a picture of something I'm really not. And um, I always say, love me or hate me. At least you you know what you see is what you get. You know, if, if we met somewhere, this is what you would get. So I think people appreciate that. Awesome, buddy. I, I'm not so sure. I can't leave without saying I'm not so sure about Trump. I think it's more of a brand than a person, but I certainly appreciate I the not self-censoring yeah. thing, however that turns out. Okay. Have an awesome uh, day. We'll talk soon. We'll, we'll just stay yeah, in touch. Absolutely. Hey, take care, Alex. Thanks again to Ricky Verandas for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview, and you could probably anticipate it. What is the nature of this pandemic evil? This is really kind of what I've been driving at ever since I wrote that book, Why Evil Matters. I mean, I think there's this next level stuff around evil that we never seem to really tackle, I mean, what is the nature of this evil that wants to put so much fear into the system, that wants everyone to be so afraid and so medically fragile? What's the evil behind wanting pregnant women to get vaccinated, even though it dramatically increases the risk of miscarriage? What is the nature of that evil? And how is it different than the Pizzagate evil that we talked about? That's next level. That's why evil matters. So let me know your thoughts on that. Let's start that dialogue because I'm not sure that we've really 
nailed that dialogue down. So that means I'm going to continue to push on it. Love to hear from you. Join me on the Skeptical Forum. Join me over on Telegram, although I set it up and I haven't been over there hardly at all. But you get the point. Track me down. I want to connect with you. I want to talk about this stuff. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.